Hello, everyone. Welcome to the June 2012 Professor Messer Network Plus Study Group. This is our monthly study group where we get together and I go through questions that you send me every month. You send me emails. You tell me all kinds of interesting things that you've run into. And hopefully I'll be able to get through this month's study group. My voice is not as strong as I was hoping for today. But uh, hopefully I'm not catching something. I'll be able to make it all the way through. We'll take lots of breaks in here and, and talk about what's going on. For those of you joining us live, welcome. We have two chat rooms going. There's a chat room at the bottom of ProfessorMesser.com. That chat room is there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's not here just for the study group. So that's one place where I am looking in a live Network Plus study group. And on our Ustream feed, there is also a chat there. I'm looking at both of them. So no matter which one you put it into, I will be able to see it. So we're going to step through a number of different things today. I've got quite a bit of topics that I've accumulated over the last month or so. This study group is brought to us by the people that support the website. So I want to extend my thanks to those folks who have purchased our Network Plus training course before. It's great to have you there and available. You're helping keeping the, the whole thing going. If you're someone who's watching our Network Plus training course online, you may not even realize there is a downloadable version that you can take offline and watch it whenever you'd like. I have somebody who sent me an email that said he bought it so he could plug it into his PS3. His PS3 can read the movie files, and he can watch it in 720p HD right from his PlayStation 3. So that was a pretty good way to do it as well. If you want to know more about that, you can visit ProfessorMesser.com slash download net plus. And if uh, those of you out there that are interested in seeing some of those videos, they're of course online. If you go to ProfessorMesser.com, all of those Network Plus videos are there and available. You're welcome to go out, have a look at those, see what's there. It's a pretty nice way to go through and learn some of these Network Plus topics. It's nice to have them there. So there are a number of different things happening on the Network Plus side. For those of you that are just getting into Network Plus, you probably went out to the CompTIA website, and it showed you that you could take uh, or download the N10004 exam objectives or the N10005 exam objectives. Or you may have signed up to take one of those exams and realized you could take either one of those. And that's a, a, a sort of a, a mid-range. We're in the middle of transitioning between one series of exams to another. Uh, CompTIA tends to update their exams about once every three years or so. And they do a good job with that. Uh, this is in those transition times that we have right now. And you can see that we have the N10004 and N10005 are the two that are in transition. The 004 is the older one. And on August 31st, just a couple of months from now, that one's going away. It'll be gone completely. You're not going to have any way to take that one anymore. You would have to take the 005. That's the brand new one. It was just released in December. That's about six months ago or so. There's some new topics in there. In a previous study group, we talked about the differences. So I got a number of questions this, this month to say, which one of these should I take now? Because there's, there's two of them. I could go either direction with this. So I'm not really sure which one to, to go with. And I think from a, a logistics perspective, you've only got two months left for the 004. If you've been studying for a number of months for the 004 content, then just stick with that. Just make sure you take the exam before August 31st. If you're just getting into this, start all of your studies with the 005. It's the latest exam. It has the latest materials, the latest information on there. So you're going to learn about all the new security things that are in the latest Network Plus. There's virtualization pieces. There's other topics they threw in that are a little bit more modern, three years more modern than the 004. There's still a lot of overlap, but the 005 is kind of nice to have the latest certification. So that's one of the nice things that's there. So if you're looking to take either one, though, you get exactly the same sheet of paper. CompTIA sends you a certification page that says, here's your A plus or Network plus or Security plus certification, regardless of which version you take. So if you take the 004, you get a sheet of paper that says, you're now Network plus certified. If you take the 005, you get a sheet of paper that says, your Network Plus certified. They look exactly the same. There's no difference. So it doesn't matter which one you take as to getting that certification. You take the one that makes sense for what you're doing with those pieces. If you already have your Network Plus certification, you can 
get credits just for attending this particular study group. So you may notice out on the CompTIA website, if you're one who's tracking these continuing education units, this is something available to you. <coughs> you can see that for the Network Plus, for the participation in an industry event, a seminar, a workshop, a podcast, webinar, or conference, you can get for Network Plus up to six continuing education units. So there's something that's useful there if you're gathering those continuing education units. Those are useful if you're planning to renew your certification by collecting all the certification units needed for the certification that you have. What a lot of people do, though, is they don't even bother with this. They don't even do continuing education units. They don't track them. They don't. There's an extra uh, maintenance fee you have to pay to track them. They don't bother with that because when you get the next higher level certification, it automatically renews the lower level certification. So if you have your A plus certification and you took that a year ago, if you take the Network Plus certification now and you pass it, you will not only get your Network Plus, but your A Plus is now renewed up to that date. So now you've got another three-year clock that's ticking. You can do the same thing for Network Plus. You can take the Security Plus, and that will renew both the A Plus and the Network Plus. And you can even take a certain number of Microsoft and Cisco certifications, third-party certifications, that will renew all three of those. So you can keep it going. So sometimes people might not even want to bother with the continuing education units and tracking them. They'll just use the things that are available to them. They know they're going to get new certifications. They'll just take new certs and get those pieces as well. CompTIA determines that level of certification, uh, the question in the chat room, based on what we have for the list uh, uh, that they have. So they consider A plus on their list to be the lowest level, Network plus to be the mid level, and Security plus to be the highest level of the exams that need to be recertified. Those are the only three CompTIA exams that must be recertified that have an expiration date associated with them. And that's the level is A plus, then Network plus, then Security plus. So pretty useful to have there and available. Let's get into your questions that you sent me. And I get these via the chat. I get, I'm get i in our chat room on Professor Messer all the time. I like to gather information about what people are talking about, things they question, send questions to me, uh, questions we do with, with subnetting. I get a lot of subnetting questions. We're going to do some this month. I don't always do subnetting because I don't really feel it's something you need to completely focus your efforts around. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but we will do some. So I've got quite a number of things. What I'd like to do first, though, is hear from you. I'd like you to go out to vote.rs, and there is a code 72286. And the question I have here is, how long have you been studying for your Network Plus certification? If you have a mobile device, you can just go to vot, vote.rs. You can type in that code, 72286, or you can use your QR code. <clears throat> if you have that mobile device just pointed at the screen, you can use that QR code. It'll flip you over to being able to see that. I'm going to flip us over to that web page right now. And now I'll have it there as well. Here we go. How long have you been studying for your Network Plus certification? I guess I got the number right, 72286. If you go out to votvote.rs, and I think I'm on the, the right page. We'll see if we get some votes coming in. I don't know if this is a dynamic page or not. I'm going to refresh it just to see what's coming in. There we go. We're seeing some come in. It is dynamic. Just need to give it a moment. There we go. When we normally do these study groups, I find that most people that are here are, are just starting the process. They're trying to figure out the pieces. And I think most people probably go about six months or so, and then you're pretty much done with the, the studying that you're planning to do. So usually we get some of those very early. But some of us, like me, I spend a long time going through content. I've got a job. There's a family. I don't have time to dedicate to some of these certifications. So sometimes it takes me many, many, many months to get through and really feel comfortable with the content that I'm looking at. And, and again, we see that here as well. We can see we've got three to six months, six to nine months. We've almost got a straight line going down there of what people are doing with this. This will help me as well as we go through some of these topics to understand more about what you're doing. You can see most of us that are here 
are less than three months just starting into these Network Plus topics. So this will be interesting to see as we go through what our options might be uh, in studying these pieces. Less than six months, you've got a lot of things to go through. And we'll cover some of these uh, in this particular study group. So let's, let's have a look now at make sure I've got the right pieces up. Let's go back to our presentation. This, this is a topic that is specific to the Network Plus certification. But it came up in the chat that we had um, this week. It, it's something that has occurred recently online. And a lot of people are asking questions about this. And that is the stories that came out over the last couple of weeks that the end of the world is nigh. And it's IP version 6 that's going to cause it. So let's let's step through what I mean by that. First, let's back up and get an understanding of what we're doing today. Today is IPv4. With IPv4, the total number of unique IP addresses that you can have with IPv4 is about 4.3 billion. That's, that's the total number of, of different permutations you can have of IP addresses. And obviously, when large blocks of IP addresses are handed out to different organizations, there are certain IP addresses that are simply not in use. So even some of that 4.3 billion are wasted. So there's no way to, to get around that. Now, one of the things you may think to yourself is, but wait a second, there is certainly more than 4.3 billion devices out here in the world connected to the network. There's mobile devices, people in their homes, there's large organizations. You've got an IP address at work, you've got an IP address at home. We've got a lot more than 4.3 billion, don't we? No, we absolutely do. And that's because we're doing some type of network address translation. If you're on a DSL line, if you have a cable modem router in your uh, in your house or at your office. Certainly, large organizations are always constantly natting. It's, it's just a given. You're doing a network address translation. So that's one of the things that is, is important to keep in mind. But the maximum number of unique addresses in IPv4 is 4.3 billion. Now, we're, we've hit a limit there with IP addresses, of course. We're running out of addresses. We've handed out all these blocks of addresses. And we're having to go back to some of the larger blocks and say, can you give us some of those back? Because we need to allocate them to other places. There are only so many public IP addresses out there in the world. So one of the things that we created was IP version 6. IPv6 gives us a lot of flexibility with addresses. And I put down these statistics here so we could get a feel for this. Um, there are 340 trillion, trillion, trillion unique addresses with IPv6. That's that's a lot. That's quite a few, isn't it? That's that's a that's a lot more than 4.3 billion. So that means of all the people on Earth, and and I estimated kind of low, but let's say there's about seven billion people on Earth, 6.8 billion. Each one of those people could have that many number of addresses each, whatever that large number is that starts with a five. So you would have that many IP addresses we could assign just to you. Those would be your unique IP addresses just for you, and you wouldn't conflict with anybody else that's out there in the world. So if we, if we even took this a step further to kind of wrap our heads around this, if we took every square foot of Earth, you could fit this large number of addresses in it. So where you're sitting, where you're standing, where you are one square foot, on this earth, we could have that many number of IP addresses. Think of the number of machines you could stack on that square foot of earth going up into the sky, and, and that's how many IP addresses you could have. So that's that's quite a few. So I also tried to put it in physical terms for us here. I grabbed a Pentium 3 chip. This is one that I've got just, you know, because I've got this stuff sitting around in my office. I think I even put it, maybe I didn't put it back. I've got all kinds of memory and chips and things sitting around. But let's say that the the size of this Pentium 3 is about the the representational size of our IPv4 address range. So let's say if, if the IP version 4 address range is that big, how big would the IPv6 address range be? And it's surprising to know if you do the math and you go through the process of of, of measuring out, calculating out, if you were to put a size to this, the IP version 6 address range would be about the size of our solar system. That's, that's pretty big from an address range perspective. So hopefully you're getting the ideas here that we've got a lot of flexibility with IPv6. There, there's a lot with IPv6 associated with that, um, that that we think about whenever we are planning to deploy and certainly thinking about the number of IP addresses available. There's a lot. 
for IPv6. That that's there. And the question in the chat room that that Benny asks is, are we ever going to need that many? Who needs that many addresses? What in the world is going on that we would need that many IP addresses? Um, we don't. But we hit a limit with IPv4, and we never wanted to hit a limit again. Converting from one IP type to another is not a trivial task. So we want to be sure that we're never going to have to convert everybody to IPv7 or whatever the next one might be. This is one of the, the things that we run into. So with that in mind, there was a number of stories that came out over the last couple of weeks. One of the stories was really broke down for us that the terrorists have won because there's IPv6. One of the stories, the FBI and the DEA warned that IPv6 may jeopardize criminal investigations. Well, that's, that doesn't sound very good. Another story that was out, IPv6 good for criminals, says the FBI and DEA. If you're a criminal, IPv6 is for you. Who knew? And my favorite of all of the different stories that I found was that FBI wants to ban new internet protocol. IP Ban IPv6. Yes, we need signs. We need to pick it. We must ban it. Well, of course, not IP, FBI did not say that they wanted to ban IPv6. So everybody calm down. There's no problem there. But certainly... This came from somewhere. Where did all these stories pop up from? How, why is everybody now saying that IPv6 will be uh, the, the way that criminals are now able to take over everything? And chat room, Steve says, was it The Onion? Is that where this came from? No, this was a legitimate, le quite a legitimate article that was put out. And I found the article. It was on CNET. This is an article that was written by Declan McCullough. Declan McCullough is the chief political correspondent for CNET. I don't know, uh, Declan's previous jobs was a reporter for Time and the Washington bureau chief for Wired. He at least has some technical know-how. He wrote the Taking Liberties section and Other People's Money column for the CBS News website. He is a a, a pub a, works in, in publishing. He is someone who is a journalist and he writes these articles. Now, the, the title of his article, as you can see here, that says, the FBI and DEA warn IPv6 could shield criminals from police. This is what we in the industry call link bait. This is what they use. They wrap a, a story that has, quite honestly, nothing to do with this particular title or only the most closest minor association with what's in the title and they put a title on the website that is just hot it is something that holy cow the fbi and the dea say that the terrorists have won it's right there in the top now i looked at the article and i i drilled down into it to see now wait how could ipv6 be a problem so i started looking at at what was written what was actually in the article i know that's crazy i'm gonna read it to see if, if it actually matches what's there. So here's the reality, is that we have this organization in the United States called ARIN. This is the American Registry for Internet Numbers. They're in charge of handing out IP addresses in North America, the United States, Canada, the, the Hawaii, parts of the Caribbean. Um, there are, I think, five or six different registries around the world, um, maybe seven. Uh, and for the United States, where I am, Aaron is the one that assigns those. And they are very particular about their IPv6. They've been, or IPv4, they've been very micromanaging and barely handing out IPv4 because we don't have so many of them left. Aaron has realized, wow, there's there's not a lot of IP addresses left. You get a little piece. You Oh, let's break off a little more. You get an even smaller piece. Let's break off another piece and get a little smaller one. They've been very tight with with putting out the IPv4 addresses. And they've been managing it. They've been putting it into a big spreadsheet. You can go to Aaron's website and you can put in an IP address and it will tell you who that IP address has been assigned to. So with IP version six though, you have all these addresses available. Aaron's just gonna chop off big chunks and hand them out and big chunks and hand them out. They're not gonna have that same micromanaging 
at least in their minds, micromanaging that they're doing today, certainly not to the level that they are doing today. They'll be able to put these blocks out there, and they'll be able to leave them there for years. They won't have to go back to people. They won't have to renew so often. It's one of those nice things about IP version 6 is we now have more flexibility with our addressing. They're going to hand those off to the internet service providers, to large organizations for their own purposes. And now they have these registered IP addresses. OK, so far, that's really no different than what we are doing today. What the article said and what the FBI and the DEA said was that there really is not a formal method in place to document IP addresses when we move to IPv6. Now, Aaron and the other organizations are doing that, but these are such large chunks of IP addresses that now it becomes more of a challenge. And what they've done is ask us to manage this. They're saying, could you please think about this as you begin deploying more and more and more IP version 6? We need to keep this in mind. Now, this probably came out this week because there was the, the worldwide IPv6 day was this month. And so a lot of these uh, online organizations, these trade magazines, wanted to have some stories around IPv6. So they, they ended up coming up with this story that said, the United States federal government is concerned about IPv6. You have to have something hot, have something that everybody wants to read. That's the story. But as we see, really, that, that wasn't the story. It was, it was really more about, let's think about how we're going to do this. When we start looking at it, IP version 6 isn't really going to hide anybody. It's not going to, to make it harder to find people. Ultimately, you'll be able to find the subnet. You'll be able to find the route back to that person. Um, there's nothing stealthy in IP version 6, although we'll talk about some privacy features that are built into IP version 6. It's, it's very interesting that when you get an IP address, it really is going back to that computer. So there's nothing that you can do that's special in IPv6 that will hide you any different than in using IP version 4. The same techniques that you can use to hide yourself in IPv4 are, yes, they're still available in IP version 6, but there's nothing about IPv6 that gives you an extra cloak of invisibility. Now, if we had everybody that was using IPv4 right now, if they, everybody went over to IP version 6, same number of people, same number of IP addresses, even though we have all of these addresses available, that doesn't mean that we're now going to use the huge number of addresses available. So that's something to keep in mind. We're not going to have a trillion, trillion, trillion addresses to sift through. We're going to have a large number. And right now, it's about 4.3 billion plus all of those others that are netted. But still, that's, that's something to keep in mind is that we're not talking about this massive number of IP addresses on day one. And we'll certainly use them as time goes on. But that's another thing to think about. So here's the bottom line, of course. We need to manage these IP addresses that are out there. The same way we're managing with IPv4, we need to think about how we're putting them out, how we're managing them with the database that they're in. Of course, the authorities need a way to track bad people who are doing bad things on the internet, just as they do today. If people are doing illegal things, there needs to be a way, a, a proper way for our authorities to find those people and bring them to justice. That's nothing new. That's what they do today with our phone systems. That's what they do with internet and our ISPs. Um, there's, there's, there can certainly be arguments made on either side of that, but that's the way things are working today. today. And of course, this is nothing new. IPv6 has been around since 1998. Was that 12 years? It's been around a while. This is not anything new. We knew there were this number of IP addresses 12 years ago. People were using IPv6 12 years ago. I worked with customers back then who had IPv6 running in their environment. Well, obviously, it's become a lot more popular recently. But it's very interesting that that is, uh, is one of those things that suddenly this week, wow, what a surprise. We have to manage this. No, it's, it's not a surprise at all. Um, the, the takeaway for you, of course, is don't trust link bait. Don't trust uh, the, the poor Declan who wrote this article, really wrote an article that was pretty accurate. And he had great quotes in there. And it was right on the money. And it properly positioned the challenges we have going forward with IPv6 and managing and maintaining this large pool of IP addresses. Unfortunately, somebody wrapped a title on the top of it that caused everybody to uh, to freak out a little bit. So don't, don't freak out a little bit. Now, now I talked about 
inside IPv6, there are, and you probably have seen this this week as well, or the last two weeks, there's a privacy feature in IPv6. It's built into the IPv6 stack now and in, in all of the latest operating systems where you can have your IP address change. You have ephemeral IP addresses. So you can use one particular IP address to go to Facebook and use a different IP address to go to Twitter. And you can change every time you visit a different site or start up a new flow, you could use a different IP address. Now, that's certainly a challenge, but we already knew that. That's already part of the IPv6 spec. It's nothing new. Again, this is something we, we all know is, is in there. But we have so many addresses that one person could pull from that the capability exists. Now, will your ISP allow you to do that? Will you be able to do that on your organization's network? It depends on exactly how they plan to implement it. But a pretty interesting, I thought, series of stories that are associated with this. So um, when in trouble or in doubt, run in circles, scream and shout is not the issue here. We don't have to worry too much about the, the sky falling right now with IPv6. We I think we've got a handle on this one. What we need to do now is do the proper due diligence, deploy it in the right way, and now IPv6 will be good for all of us. Now, from an IPv6 perspective, it's a learning opportunity. So here's the learning opportunity for us, which is which of these are not advantages of IPv6 automatic IP address configuration and integrated network layer security, a static header size with optional extensions and integrated peer-to-peer -peer client, randomized IP address options. You can vote right now at votevot.rs. Use the number 97676. <clears throat> Everybody hum to yourself for a moment. I'm going to leave this up so you can pull out your mobile device and click that QR code. <clears throat> Let's flip over the vote.rs.and uh, 97676 is the code. Let's, let's flip over my tab over to that one. Which of these are not advantages? I'm going to click and refresh this page so we get things going here. So IPv6 has a lot of different capabilities associated with it, uh, a ton of different things that you can do. Um, and it's, it's quite remarkable, actually, that we've been able to improve so much over IPv4 with the implementation of IPv6. Uh, the question again, which of these are not advantages of IPv6 and automatic IP address configuration, integrated network layer security, static header sizes with optional extension headers, integrated peer-to-peer -peer client, and randomized IP address options. Most of you were not fooled. There is no integrated peer-to-peer -peer client. There's no BitTorrent built into IPv6. But wouldn't that be nice if there was? It'd be just so easy to pull down our latest Linux distribution as part. We'd not have to load up a client. It'd be right there. Let's step through each one of these, because this is interesting to know about anyway. Automatic IP address configuration. You don't get that today with IPv4, where you sort of, with the, the extra pieces that certain operating systems have built into it with the automatic IP addressing protocols that are out there. But there is built into IPv6 now, you can automatically get an IP address and communicate on your local link as part of the protocol. It's not an operating system specific thing any longer. So that's very nice to be able to do something like that. Uh, integrated network layer security, IPsec is built into IPv6. It's part of the specification, very cool. With IPv4, there's a lot of things in the header. And a lot of the things that are in the IPv4 header you don't need. If you're not doing quality of service, why do you have to have quality of service bits in an IPv4 header? Well, with IPv6, it's optional. You have a, a static sized header. The header is only a certain size. If you need extra capabilities, you can essentially add on chunks to the header as you need them. That makes the protocol much more efficient. It uses up only the amount of room that we need. Very nice capabilities. And there is randomized IP address options. I just mentioned that, where you can have one IP address that you're using for Facebook, and IPv6 will use a different IP address to go to Twitter. So very nice to be able to have that there and those capabilities. Some interesting things that we ran across this month when looking at that particular store. And I thought it was a nice one to go through so that we had an idea of what we could do with that IPv6 and things to learn about IPv6. Well, let's go into questions that I got also. I got a number of questions in the chat room, questions that we are, are, are going through. Before we get into those, let me check the chat room real quick. Um, 
So uh, a lot of you, if you're watching this live, one of the things you may notice is that ads do pop up from time to time. This live stream that we're doing that's going out to hundreds of people in real time is not something I pay for. This is nice. But the trade-off, of course, is that ads do pop up from time to time. There will be a replay of this that is online. Hopefully, I'll get it up by the end of the day. If not, it'll be online on Sunday morning. So that's one nice capability that is there. Uh, so uh, it does help pay for the stream, though. I don't have to pay hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars just to have this here. I do have an option to get rid of the ads. It literally would be hundreds and hundreds of dollars to be able to do this hour-long live stream. So I appreciate your patience with watching some of those ads come through. It, it does help quite a bit to be able to do this live event. Um, other questions that come through... Um, is, is IPv6 more efficient? IPv, IPv6 is a lot more efficient. We talked about the headers being a static size and being able to have those things in there. From a routing perspective, IPv6 is much more efficient because of the way that we set up the subnetting in IPv6. We don't have this variable link subnet masking that we do with IPv4. You could, but it's highly recommended you don't. IPv6 is set up so the, the, the there are very specific separations between the network, the subnet, and the hosts that are on that subnet. So that part is nice as well. Maybe for the next uh, study group, we'll go through a little bit more of that. But I get a lot of questions about IPv4 subnetting. And one of the questions I have for us today is, what is the broadcast address of this host, 192.168.100.66 slash 27? This is, um, this is I, I don't like to do a lot of these subnetting questions. Not because it's not important, because it is. I think subnetting is an important thing to know. But we often get very wrapped around the axle when we are working on our Network Plus certification. There are so many topics in Network Plus. And because this involves math, you can spend a lot of time trying to figure it out, hours and days of your time. Uh, my recommendation is absolutely spend time understanding subnetting. It is important. Do not obsess over the fact that you may be struggling or in some cases not getting subnetting at all. In the big scheme of things, it might be one or two questions on your exam of, what is it, 100 questions? There's a lot of questions you have to take. So of that 100 questions, there might be two of them. If you missed those two, you would have been much better off studying other topics and getting those right rather than worrying about if you got subnetting right or wrong. So just, just uh, balance it out is my, my feedback to you. But let's do this. Yes, in the chat room, use a subnet calculator, which is, by the way, how everybody else does it who's not taking an exam. But we're not those people. We have to take an exam. When you walk into your exam, they will give you a whiteboard or they will give you a piece of paper, a blank piece of paper and a pencil. And you can use that to do calculations during your certification. So you will have something to write on. So this is useful. So let's step through 192.168.100.66 and calculate it out. I'm not going to use shortcuts. I'm not going to use ways to make it quicker. I'm going to show you the actual calculations. And, and there are other ways to do this. There are a lot of websites out there you can go to that will show you quick ways to do this. I want to show you how to do it. And if you later on, once you understand it, want to use those quick ways, knock yourself out. But let's go through this piece of it. So our question that we have is we have 192.168.100.66 slash 27. So slash 27. So already, we're going to have to figure that out. I need a subnet mask. Is that 255.255.something? What is that? So let's let's calculate it out. What we'll do is, and if you, if you aren't catching this binary calculation, binary to decimal and decimal to binary, I have a video that steps through how to do binary to decimal how to do decimal to binary. And it takes you right through in just a matter of minutes, you'll have it down. So if you're, you're not quite at that point, some of this next few minutes, you may be struggling with a bit. So 27 bits, let's calculate out, just write down 27 ones, and then finish up the last octets because we have eight of ones or zeros and all of these octets. We'll put ones, 27 ones, and we'll finish up the rest of the bits with zeros. And if we do the calculations, you can see the calculation ends up being 255.255.255. Here's the last octet. 1110000 is 224. So there already, we've at least figured out that slash 27 is the same thing as 255.255.255.224. So our real question is, 
what is, I think it was, what was the broadcast address, right? So we have to figure out from this what the broadcast address might be. The first thing we should do is write down in binary the IP address and write down in binary the subnet mask. So let's do that. We will put down 192.168.100.66, and we'll calculate out for each of these octets what the binary representation of those is. For instance, 192 is 11000000. 168 is... 10101000. We're doing that math and we're putting these on the piece of paper. That's going to help a lot in, in when we finally get down to this piece of it. Now, of course, we already did the calculation for the subnet mask of 255, 255, 255, 224, which is the slash 27. So let's simply add that underneath there as well. So now we've got everything we need to calculate our our broadcast address for this subnet. So what we'd like to be able to do is what we'll do what we call a bitwise AND. It's kind of a fancy term. We use it a lot in programming when we're developing software. What this really means is we're going to look at each column of this. If there are two ones, we're going to bring down a one. If there's a one or a zero, we're going to bring down a zero. And if there is a zero and a zero, we're going to bring down a zero. So the only time you would put a one down beneath this line is if there's a one in the top and a one in the bottom. And we put all of these down all the way through. And we leave it exactly the way it is right now with all of these ones and zeros. We just calculate it all out. And then we have this number that's here at the bottom. So now what we want to do is reverse this, change it back from binary, change it into decimal. If we take each one of these, it's one. this is 192.168.100.64. Notice that we left. These zeros that were at the end of the subnet mask, we left them zeros. And because we left them zeros, that tells us what the subnet address is. We're a little bit closer to knowing the broadcast. The subnet address for 192.168.100.66/27 is 192.168.100.64. That's where the subnet begins. To calculate the broadcast address, we do all ones. So we take all of those zeros that we have there, and we change them to all ones. And we perform exactly the same calculation again. So do your conversion back. It would be 192.168.100.95. There you go. That's it. Now we're done. That's the end of the question. We have looked and determined the subnet mass slash 27 and calculated out what that is. We've looked at and calculated out what the subnet address is by leaving the zeros in place, dot 64. And we've calculated out the broadcast address by changing all those zeros to ones and recalculating its dot 95. That's it. You now have the subnet and broadcast address. Uh, the, the question that we had of broadcast address is 192.168.100.95 is the broadcast address for that IP address. So anytime you get an IP address question, you're going to perform the same function every time. It's exactly the same every time. It doesn't change. As soon as you figure out that flow all the way to the bottom, it's exactly the same every time. It's really not that hard once you do two or three of them. Now, on your test, you might get one question like this. You might get two. You might get zero. So again, balance this out with all the rest of the studies that you're doing. I think it's time for another quiz. What subnet mask is represented by slash 22? So remember when we took and figured out the 255.255, the .255, whatever that was. I'm looking for a subnet mask that is in decimal for the slash 22 subnet. Don't answer in the chat room. We want to go to vote.rs, vot.rs, use the code 47612, or pop open your QR code reader and have a look with the QR code. That'll take you right to the web page. 47612 is the number. Let's flip over there myself. Got the old question up. Let's go to the new question, which is what subnet mask is represented by slash 22. And they're coming in. We're getting some answers coming in. Slash 22, what could it be? What could it be? We've got a number to choose from here, of course. We've got 255, 255, 192.0, 255, 255, 252.0. And then others are listed there as well. Find the one you think is correct. And go to vote, vot.rs, use code 47612, and put in what you think subnet mass slash 22 is. Now, if we were doing this in the test, we would write out all the ones. We would write out 22 ones 
and then we will put zeros to fill in the rest of those bits that are in those four octets. So already there's a hint for you if you're calculating this yourself. Right in, there's eight ones, there's 16 ones, there's 22. We'll put in a bunch of zeros after that, and we'll figure out what the subnet mask is. Let's step through how you might calculate that. So we've got a few questions, a few answers have come in. Let's calculate that slash 22. Let's flip back to our presentation. Here's how I would have done it. Let's look at our subnet mask. We know it's a slash 22 that we're looking at. So we're going to, again, write down 22 ones. Just draw one, 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 22 of them. There's, there's 8, there's 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So I did 22 of them. I think that's what I said. It's a slash 22. We need 22 ones. Then we put in zeros to fill in the rest of the octets that are there. That's our subnet mask. All we have to do is convert decimal from this binary. So let's do that. Let's put in, here's how we do it. If you go look at our, our conversion uh, binary math video, this is how we do it. So let's pull down. I really want to calculate that subnet that's right here, the, the one that has the ones and the zeros in it. Because I know all ones is 255. I know that all zeros is, well, zero makes it easy. So let's do this one where I've got all of those, that third octet, and let's calculate it out. The way you do that is right above that number, you would fill in these, these, these codes. These are the keys you're going to use. One, two, four, we're going to double. Eight, double, 16, 32, 64, 128. Just write those down. So you're going to use that as your key every time you want to convert from binary to decimal. And all we're going to do is now add these up. We're going to, every time there is a one, we're going to bring down the number that's on the top. Every time there's a zero, we're not going to bring the number down. So at the end of it, we'll have 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 0 plus 0, because we had zeros in the way right there. We add all of those up, and we get 252 decimal. So if you're needing to calculate a subnet, that's the way to do it. And that means that our subnet for slash 22 is 255.255.255. .255 252.0. Hopefully you guys got that as well. I think we want to get a final tally. Eight of you are had that. So most of you got that one right. So you're ready for your Network Plus certification exam, at least that subnetting part of it. You may be in good shape there for gathering those pieces and being ready to take it. I think that would be pretty useful for what you're doing. One of the questions that came in was, gosh, why do you even need a broadcast address? What's that about? Why am I calculating subnets? Why am I doing this? Why am I racking my brain trying to figure out how to calculate all of these numbers? Well, it's because we need broadcast addresses. And, and there's a number of reasons why we need broadcasts on our network. You, the, the adapter, the physical card that's plugged into your Ethernet network or the one that you have on your wireless network, that adapter card does not listen and gather packets, all the packets that are sent, being sent out over the network because it doesn't care. If there's a packet that's going to a computer that's across the room, your computer doesn't care. And so therefore, it'll ignore them. The only thing your computer is looking for are unicasts, which are packets that are sent directly to your computer. It's looking for broadcasts. Those are packets sent to every computer on the subnet. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. And it's looking for multicast frames as well. Those are frames that are sent to multiple people with one single frame. That's a very, very efficient way to send out some of that information, being able to see it as well. Now, broadcasts, they are something you have to have on your network. This is a situations where you need to be able to send out a piece of information and have everybody on the subnet see this information. And the type of information might be things like Windows networking updates, when you need to broadcast that you are looking for a work group, or you're participating in a work group, or you are the, the, the master of that work group, you're the lead on that work group. Those all, those all happen behind the scenes. We don't see these frames going back and forth. Nothing pops up on our Windows workstations, but those broadcasts are in place to let everybody know that you are now the browser lead for that particular work group, for instance. Applications communicate this way. If you've used something, here's here's one a lot of us use, which um, on my workstation, I use this a lot, is I've got a Dropbox configuration on, I have a bunch of computers in front of me. I have a Dropbox configuration on the big computer that's in front of me. I have a Dropbox configuration on the laptop that is I'm also using in my office, and I use them both at the same time. So I've got Dropbox running on both. Now, if I take a file, and I drop it into my Dropbox, what happens is that 
it of course is going to make a copy of that file and send it up to the Dropbox server and put it out there in the cloud. But one of the nice things that Dropbox does is that if there's a machine that's local on the subnet, it'll simply copy it over to that machine. It doesn't have to go out to the cloud and then come back down. It's a waste of bandwidth. Why would I do that? Just send it up to the cloud one time. Dropbox knows that there's another machine that's on my local subnet that is part of Dropbox, and it also is that same user. And it's able to recognize that and just send the file over directly on that subnet. The way that it knows that another machine is on that subnet sends a broadcast. Hey, is anybody else out there running Dropbox? Oh, you are? Hey, you're signed in with the same account. If I ever need to update anything, I'm just going to send it to you directly. That's a great reason to use a broadcast. Routers also do this when they're sending router updates. A lot of the router updates these days use multicast or they are directed frames. Uh, used to be when we were using just RIP, the routing information protocol, it used broadcasts. And everybody on the network got to see those broadcasts. Obviously, you don't want too many broadcasts. You get a broadcast storm, they call it. That could slow down everybody on the network because, as I said, everybody has to pull in and look at a broadcast frame. It's very useful to have that there. And, uh, and have that available. One of the next questions I got, I had a lot this month, didn't we? One of the questions I got, why does gigabit ethernet not require a crossover cable standard? What is up with that? Now, this probably came from Gregory who plugged in, had a, had a, had a patch cable where he used, he plugged into a switch from his, from his laptop, from his computer, that worked great. Then he maybe had a second computer and plugged in the same patch cable between two computers, and it worked. But wait a second. If you have two computers, you're supposed to use a crossover cable to connect those. Every single thing you read says you have to have a crossover cable to connect two computers directly to each other. That was not a crossover cable, and yet it worked. It was magic. How did that happen? So that, that's, a, that's a bit of a mystery, isn't it? You may have done this yourself. In fact, you may have just realized, well, I don't have a crossover cable, so, well, I can't use that. But there are some interesting things about the, the Ethernet specification that allow us to do this. Now, a straight-through cable is what we normally use as our patch cable. It's what we would go from one computer, plug it into a switch, one computer, plug it into a router. We're plugging in a in-station to a piece of infrastructure equipment. And what's important about this when we're connecting these things together is that all these wires in a patch cable go straight through. They are going pin 1 goes to pin 1, pin 8 goes to pin 8, and everything in the middle goes to the exact same pin on the other side. Now, one of the things you'll find when you start plugging in, let's say you've got a network interface card on one side and you have a switch on the other side. You're plugging in this patch cable. The switch is set up. So that pin 1, which is transmitting on your side, the switch, it's not transmit. It is a receive. You can't go from transmit to transmit. You have to go to transmit, and the other side has to be listening for that. So if you were to look at the switch configuration, you would see pin 1 on a switch is set to receive. Pin 1 and 2 are set to receive plus and receive minus. It's actually sending the same signal, but inverted over both of those. Kind of out, outside the scope of what we're talking about today. But just keep in mind, on one side is transmit, on the other side is receive. Notice that we call them different things. This, inter this network interface card on your laptop, on your computer, is called the Media Dependent Interface, the MDI. And you'll see this term. If you go into the configuration of your Ethernet adapter, you'll see that term inside there. You'll probably also see the term MDIX, M-D-I-X. That is the Media Dependent Interface crossover. The MDIX has received on pin 1 and 2. The MDI has transmit on pin 1 and 2. That's effectively the only difference that's there. Now, there's something inside of Ethernet that gives us some flexibility. Because normally, if you wanted to connect an MDI to an MDI, you would need a crossover cable. You would need a way to take what's on pin 1 and send it to pin 3. You would need to effectively do that reversal. Because if both sides, I'm going to back up one slide. If you look at the media dependent interface, the network interface card, if you took pin this this one and two transmit and you plugged it into another laptop to one and two, that's transmit. Transmit, transmit. That won't work. I need pin one to go to pin three. I need pin two to go to pin six. And that's effectively what we do with the crossover cable. And that allows us to connect MDI to MDI and allows us to connect 
MDIX to MDIX. Now, here's the secret. Here's the reason why you don't need a crossover cable to plug in MDI to MDI or MDIX to MDIX on our modern equipment because there's a feature inside the chipset of these Ethernet devices called Auto MDIX, which means when we plug in the cable, it just listens and figures out what's on the other side, and then it adjusts itself accordingly. It effectively turns itself into either MDI or MDIX based on what's on the other side of the cable. That's it. So inside of your Ethernet adapter, there is most probably a feature you can turn on and off called Auto MDIX. And almost always, I think on every single one I've ever seen, this is turned on, which means I can take two laptops, plug them in straight through. It works. Ooh, it's magic. But you can turn that off if you want to. There have been chipsets made in Ethernet that did not work exactly the way they should when they were in an auto MDIX mode. That's a pretty unusual situation. But let's say you just wanted to use a crossover cable. You want to force it to always use the crossover cable. You could turn that feature off, and that Ethernet chipset would not automatically figure out that piece. But boy, that's really, really useful when you're trying to, to use these devices and being able to automatically connect them together is to have that, that auto MDIX capability. Use the same cables you got. You don't have to make another cable. You don't have to buy another cable. Use exactly the same cables you have, and they work like magic. Let's uh, go to our next question that we have. Next question came in. What study tools would you recommend for the Network Plus exam? Now, some of you have seen in the past, uh, as I put together some of these videos, they follow the exact format of the CompTIA Network Plus exam objectives documentation. But if you've ever read the Network Plus exam documentation, the objectives, they're not really in a very logical order. If you're reading a Network Plus book, You'll notice the book's in a really logical order. It's laid out so nice. But it's kind of hard to create videos that follow that same path because these videos stand alone on themselves. So one of the things that, that I've done is I've talked to and, and um, partnered with a company called GTS Learning. I met with these guys when I was, uh, they're based out of London. So I met with them when I was in London in November. And we said, how can we take this, this conflict that we have? We have these books that are really nicely laid out which GTS Learning has been creating for years and years and years and years. And we got my videos that are in CompTIA's format, which really don't flow together nicely. And they said, why don't we just put them together? Yellow and blue make green. Two great, great tastes that taste great together. And that's exactly what we've done. We've created a product called Freestyle. If you go out to professormesser.com slash freestyle, you can learn all about this. There's a sample version of Freestyle you can look at. What we've effectively done, and I, I probably need to refresh this page because it's timed out on me so far, what we've done is take this idea of what we're doing with this freestyle, and we're building it out so that we can have all of these things in one place. I can go through Network Plus certifications in freestyle. I'm going to log in with my username here. And this is the Network Plus book all online. The entire thing that GTS Learning, which is a CompTIA authorized partner, all of their materials have been certified by CompTIA. CompTIA looks at that and goes, yeah, this is perfect for the exam. This is exactly what you want. There are prerequisite tests on here. There are sample exams that you can take on here. There's a practice exam for the N10005. There's 100 questions. You have 90 minutes. Go. I could perhaps, I've already done this once to go through it. Continue my last attempt. And you go through the questions. And you can answer all the questions that happen to be there. Another nice thing about this, though, is we not only have all this content here, but I'm going to pull up um, let's pull up a, a unit, IPv6 study notes. I'm just going through the different versions. So here's IPv6. We're just talking about IPv6 and all the things associated with it. And describes the RFCs and talks about how you would communicate via IPv6 and all the different pieces that are there. All the materials you need, all the graphics you need, all the details you need are right in here. So you've already got a lot of the details that normally you'd have to buy a book and carry around with you are right there. Another nice capability that is in this view, I'm going to pull you down to a, a unit where we have some other pieces in it. Inside of all these study notes are my videos. So if you want to see along with the content, if I scroll down, you can see this is the 
the, uh, the, the section of the book, effectively, that's on routing tables. And right there, some guy, he's talking. Let me, uh, let me turn him up a bit. I got him. Oh, he's on my laptop. Here we go. The table is essentially a list of directions. I know him. This is where the packets will be stopping into a router. How about that? So what they've done is get rid of that problem where you have all of these different things every you have all these different videos are thrown everywhere there's books that are so well laid out now it's all in one place along with all of the tests that you might want to take some sample exams and after every one of these chapters they've got samples so they of course uh, are a partner of mine they help sponsor a lot of the things that we do a lot of the content that i do for my videos comes directly from their books so it's, it's very nice to have that there and if you're looking in some way to uh, help support what we're doing here at Professor Messer, and you need some of these materials, that might be a great way to do it. You would go out to professormesser.com slash freestyle and go through what they might have for materials. As I mentioned, they've got some free samples you can go to right now and try it out yourself. And if you like it, you might want to invest in that. If you don't like it, you can, of course, get a book from somewhere else. But that's another option that we brought together. I love the combination of, of all those things together, being able to blend all those through. It, it's, it's really quite something. When we started putting this together, it was a great idea, and it, they really did a great job of putting it together. Let's go through some of the questions you send me about A+, plus and some of the things we, we might want to look at, our, our Network Plus, and some of the things we might want to look at from a Network Plus perspective. First question from JB, is there any lab or practical work that must be done for the Network Plus certification? This is, of course, a concern. If you're planning to take a test, are there any prerequisites? Uh, do we need to buy a bunch of equipment and set it up? Do we need a lab set up? You don't need any of those. The, the Network Plus certification is one that is really the beginnings of understanding how to do networking. A lot of the things that you might want to do from a hands-on perspective, running trace routes, running pings, understanding where the packets are going, or even capturing packets if you wanted to go down to that level, you can do with your computer you've got in front of you. You don't need a lab. You don't need a lot of different pieces. Uh, you don't need a lot of those that are there. It's very, very simple to be able to go through those pieces and, and understand what's going on there. I think that's one of the things that's important from my perspective as well is that you're able to understand it. And you've got all the tools that you need to be able to understand those things. You don't need anything more than what's already there. Um, you've got it all on your workstation. And it doesn't matter whether you're running Windows, or you're running Mac OS X, you're running Linux. You've got all the tools you need to be able to do the network. So don't worry about buying equipment. Don't worry about setting up a lab. Don't worry about doing anything else other than going through the materials and understanding what's there. So that's kind of nice to have that, that there as well. Here's one I get a lot. This question comes in, says there's hundreds of acronyms in networking, a ton of acronyms that are there. How in the world am I ever going to remember all the acronyms that are out there and available. And it, it is a bit of a challenge. Robert's absolutely right, is there's a lot of things there. But fortunately, there's things you can do to, to minimize this. I'm going to go out to comptia.org, and we're going to have a look at this. So here's the CompTIA website. We can at least limit some of the things that are here. And if you have not done this already, and you are taking any of the CompTIA certifications, go do this. It, it's surprising to me how many people ask me, hey, is, uh, is IPsec on the exam? Do we need to know how to do this thing? Do we need to understand this particular topic? You don't know? You haven't looked at what's on the exam? You should do that. So on the CompTIA website, there's a certifications pull down or, or a button. I'm going to click that. And it takes us to this certification. If under Get Certified, I'm going to choose Network Plus. And here's the CompTIA Network Plus. It tells you all about the exam. It tells you about the retirement of the 004. It tells you what's involved. And there's a button in here that says, see what the exam covers. And if you click on that, it's going to pull up an exam objectives page that you would put in your name. And I'm, I'm trying not to have it autofill with all of my uh, address information. So I'm sort of hiding my screen here for a moment. And at the bottom of the screen, you will see an option that says, what do you want to download? Which, which certification exam objectives? I want to do Network Plus. And I'm just going to choose that and say, get exam objectives. And off it goes. And notice it's going to give you the 004 and the 005. And it's going to give you everything that's associated with Network Plus, also the Spanish 
language version as well. We want 005. I'm going to click that. I'm in Chrome, so it just pops right up with the exam objectives page. And I'm going to scroll to the bottom. You can see the exam objectives. They're huge. There's everything you need to know are in here, um, that piece of it. Uh, I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom because at the bottom is this that says Network Plus Acronym List. So there, of course, there are a lot of acronyms in there. But if you're trying to limit what you have to be able to memorize, they're right here. And it's uh, one page worth, two pages worth. There's three. There's a lot of acronyms. There's no question that in networking and in security, we do a lot with acronyms. But if you're trying to determine where can I limit my view, there they are. I guess there's a, there's a few pages all the way at the bottom. So that that's one of the things that when you, you're trying to maybe set up and do your own flashcards or you're trying to go through a list and check off what you happen to know, it's your exam objectives document. Don't miss that. There's great things there that you could take advantage of. Be sure to go through and take advantage of those. It's one of those nice parts about having those exam objectives. Not all organizations give you that level of detail. So make sure you take advantage of those pieces and being able to do something with all of those different exam objectives. Let's uh, also this down now we're getting sort of near the, the top of the hour We're we're getting to the end of this month's study group, but I wanted to give you something available that's um, we talked a lot about IPv6. Um, and IPv6 is a bit of a mystery but just because we haven't used a lot of IPv6 with what we're doing. So if you want to go out to Aaron, Aaron has a great IPv6 info center. Let me get rid of my head on the screen so you can see the entire URL, which is Aaron.net slash knowledge slash IPv6 underscore info underscore center dot HTML. And there are a lot of HTML or excuse me, a lot of IP version 6 documents that are out here from very beginnings of understanding how IPv6 works all the way up into some very advanced uses of IPv6 and how Aaron is working to make those IPv6 pools of IP addresses available to everyone. So it's very useful to have there as well. Make sure you take advantage of that. There's all kinds of great free materials out there on the net. Aaron did a great job of putting together a lot of the IPv6 pieces as well. Well, that brings us to the end of my topics, my formal topics for the study group. I think we've gone through, I've tried to answer a lot of the questions in the chat rooms, but this might be your opportunity to throw some questions out. I know there were some as we were going through some uh, topics for next time. We were talking about uh, some of the latest uh, wireless capabilities, the wireless standards that are coming out out there. I've got all the chat here, and it's, uh, it's saved off. So I'll be going through and using that as well and being able to do that. Um, the the uh, the videos are the the study groups that we do in the chat room. We do one a month. So if you are interested in going to a plus study group, we do one of those a month. And the network plus study group, we do one of those month uh, a month as well. That's a very very useful to have. Uh, bulletproof mask in the chat room asks when routers decide when they're sending out these these broadcasts. These any he said calling them any cast, but that's effectively what it is. It's a broadcast. Uh, what do they do? How do they send that? Uh, it's a way to take all of uh, the what's in our our destination IP address and we set them all the ones. It goes to 255.255.255.255. That is uh, when we're talking about doing uh, a broadcast to an IP subnet. That is an all ones broadcast. If you're sending it just to a subnet, and this is usually what you'll see, we use that broadcast address that we calculated earlier. So they may just set it up with that broadcast address calculated based on what subnet it happens to be uh, connected to. The study materials that I, I was just talking about in freestyle is professormesser.com slash freestyle and being able to do that. You know, there's only this anycast idea. There's there's broadcast, there's unicast, there's multicast. There's a that is well, there may be some other term that another manufacturer might use for one of those three things, but those are the three that generally we talk about in standardization. Uh, do you do I have to buy a book or should the video be enough? Uh, you should um, uh, there are people that will see my videos and say this is a pretty comprehensive list of all of these videos that are here. I'll just use the videos. Um, but why would you just use the videos? The books are relatively inexpensive, very, very, in some cases, free. You can go to the library and get a good uh, study book to use with this. And there are things I can't cover in a video that you can cover in a book because the book has so much more information inside of it. Videos are a great visual way 
to learn about this content. There's some of this content you just can't do easily in a video. So I think a good um, a good strategy for everybody is to, yes, use the videos. Why wouldn't you? They're free, but also get a good book to go along with them. I think it makes a big difference. Uh, if you want proof on this attending this study group so you can send a CompTIA, there are instructions on the CompTIA certifications to tell you exactly what you would send to them. I don't have to do anything. You simply document what you were watching, and that's what you send in to get credit for that. So that's very easy for you to be able to do that. Uh, one of the questions in the uh, Professor Messer chat room, does the Network Plus help you prepare for the CCNA? Um, or is it best just to go for the CCNA exam? And the CCNA is a Cisco network exam. There's a lot of the overlap between the Cisco CCNA type exams and the Network Plus exam. Uh, certainly the fundamentals are on both of those exams. Understanding IP addressing, understanding IPv6, knowing how to subnet. The Cisco certifications obviously go into a lot of detail on how to use the Cisco command line which of course is very, very vendor specific. Learning that is not going to help you if you need to manage a firewall from another company or a switch from a different company or a router from another company. Those are Cisco specific things. So of course they're going to ask that on their certification exams. There are a number of topics that are not covered on the Cisco CCNAs that are covered in Network Plus. You'll want to look at the exam objectives for both of them. But I think there's probably the vast majority of the, of the fundamental networking content is probably the same between them. It's probably a pretty good mix, though. I don't do any Cisco videos. I have no plans currently to create any Cisco videos. So I've just not looked at the details of the CCNA. I've looked at them. I've downloaded them. I've, I've gone through them once or twice. But I haven't done any detailed analysis of the differences between those. That would be a, a great topic, a great thing for you to do. So feel free to do that. Uh, healthcare IT is it's a pretty popular one. I, a year ago, not a lot of people asking me for the healthcare certification from CompTIA. There's certainly a lot of people asking about that, and there's such a networking overlap with that. Uh, currently, I don't have the healthcare IT on my production schedule, but you never know. Just keep checking back with what we're doing on our website. Occasionally, we just start creating videos because we think it might be a great idea. So we start sticking things out there just to see what would happen from that piece. Um, some, some very nice capabilities to be able to do that. Well, I think that uh, that comes up to the end of what we're doing for our formal Network Plus study group. If you'd like to follow us and what we're doing, you want to know when I make a new video. You want to know if I'm thinking about other ideas for videos, or you want to send me your ideas for videos, you can visit us on Facebook at ProfessorMesser.com slash Facebook. You can visit us on Twitter at ProfessorMesser.com slash Twitter. We also have videos on uh, things that we put on Google Plus. If you're a Google Plus person, you can go to professormesser.com slash Google Plus. Do you see a trend here? And for YouTube, professormesser.com slash YouTube. If you go out to our YouTube videos, make sure you give a thumbs up. Or you know, if you don't like it, give a thumbs down. I guess you can do that as well. I want to hear all kinds of different feedback. You can put comments on there. And of course, we have all of those on our website as well. You can look at that. Feel free to take advantage of that that free sample that's out there on GTS Learning at professormesser.com slash freestyle. And of course, thanks to all of you. Thanks for joining us in the chat room. We had so many people joining us in here on both chat rooms today. Your feedback is incredibly useful. I wouldn't be able to put this together without you sending me these questions and giving me this feedback. So it's very, very valuable to me as well. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate you being here. We'll see you next month as well on the Professor Messer Network Plus Study Group.